So round of applause for the first talk, uh, Rashmi. And the slides are here. Hi everyone, I'm Rashmi and I'm a software engineer based in India. So my talk title is Go for the JavaScript Developers. So let's get started. Go is like the sea and the python has a kid. So it's a common saying that Go possesses the confidence and the athletic ability like a sea. And it has the sim good looks and the pleasant demeanor like a python. So what exactly is Go? It's an open source compiled and garbage collected concurrent system programming language which is blazing fast because it has a young compiler with minimal speed optimization and also it has a strict compiler and so it's something like the things like unused imports and the unused variables or hard compiled errors in Go. And uh, it possesses clean and elegant syntax. So what are the similarities between the Go and the JavaScript? So both uses the garbage collection and the variables and the functions, they have a specific scope. And in similar fashions, they define the variable structures and for loops and the if statements. What are the major differences between the uh, Go and the JavaScript? So JavaScript is a single thread that it has the main thread, which, has, uh, which does this event loop. And there are several other threads which do the external input output, while in the Go, the concurrence is the king, in the sense that it has the Go routines. And the JavaScript is interpreted language. It runs before, uh, it is, uh, the code is compiled before it runs, while Go is a compiled language. And also in Go, uh, we can have ret uh, multiple return statements that is, if you have, let's say, an error called uh, 500 internals of error or something like that, particular functions can return the multiple uh, error codes. Or, so it's very consistent and it's easy to maintain. So basic uh, rules uh, that the lines don't have uh, don't end with a semicolon, and so it's a so a very simple example is declaration of the array of size three, which has integer values. Uh, one, two, and three, and there is a comma at the end of the three. And the basic uh, types like uh, var num int is equal to five, so, uh, so it says that the variable name, that is num, it's being declared before the integer, uh, the data type itself. Uh, so in similar fashion, the for loop and the while loop, so the, uh, the similarity which we can see in those of them is that they uh, don't have the parentheses. Um, and uh, in the same way, the uh, uh, flow control, that is, there is no parentheses in the if statement. It returns false when the age is less than 18 or so what are the, uh, so there are some of the advanced features in uh, Go that are the Go routines, which I already talked before, that concurrency uh, is the king in the Go, which, uh, so the Go routine is basically a lightweight thread, which is managed by the Go runtime. And uh, so here, uh, Go, func, uh, I mean the function and the ABC are the three parameters. So what happens is the function and the evaluation of the ABC will happen in the same thread itself, while the function will, uh, the ex the function will be uh, executed in the uh, in the different thread, and um, the channels they can be thought of as the pipelines or the pipes like uh, in which the Go routines themselves communicate, and they also possess a type associated with it that is the data which is allowed to transport through that uh, particular channel, uh, and it's being declared using this uh, operator that is a channel operator. Here we can see in an example that channel B. So it's, uh, V is being sent to the channel C H. And similar way, uh, and how we are assigning the value to the V is, uh, I mean, th that channel uh, receive the value from that particular channel and assign it to the uh, variable that is V. Okay, and the personal takeaway is that those who have not yet started with the Go, it's never too late to start something anew, all, uh, a fresh, all it takes is pra uh, practice, patience, and perseverance. I really want to thank Carolyn, Rita, and Mathiche for helping me, um, I mean, getting introduced to the Go language, and thank you for inspiring me a lot. That's it. Okay, so up next, Tomasz. Round of applause for him too, please. Okay, uh, so hello, I'm Tomasz, and today I will show you my debugging adventure with Golang. So one evening, my colleague was deploying a service on our infrastructure, 
And what happened? It, this service was uh, not appear in our production. It was deployed, but it wasn't attached to a load balancer and console, which was our discovery solution. Uh, so I asked him, hey, try deploy it one more time, but obviously it doesn't uh, help. And so we started debugging, like what could be a problem? Uh, at that time, <laughs> At the time, our infrastructure was built on uh, Marathon, which is our application uh, scheduler, console, discovery solution, Marathon console, which ties application develop, uh, deployed on Marathon to console, and the service that was deployed. Uh, so we had uh, like uh, 300 services, and only one has a problem. Uh, so what has happened? This application has exposed two ports, one for admin and one for the rest of the world. Uh, each port has a tags, and both ports were uh, registered with the same tags. So, because the, it was tagged with uh, has the same tags, one port uh, disappeared from console. Uh, so, what has changed? Because this service was deployed many times a day, uh, one tag uh, has been append. Uh, so, at the time, we have 80% of our uh, uh, application has only one port. Uh, 8% uh, has uh, tags, and only one that fails has multiple target port. So let's take a look at code, and here's a bug, like something here. Uh, so what happened? Mm, we just add one tag, and we end up with two same slices. Uh, I will unroll this uh, for loop for you, uh, so it looks like this. and. You can guess what function A and function B prints. Like, uh, I haven't been expecting this at the time. So, what happened? Uh, yeah, slices. Uh, when we, what is slice? Slice is just a free elements, like a pointer to a, a array, length, and capacity. And when we append it to the slice, and it has su sufficient capacity, we only change the last element and update the length. So in our example, it looks like this. We start with a slice like this, then append element, then append next element, and next element, finish with three variables pointing to the same space in a uh, in a disk, uh, in a heap. Uh, so, yeah, when we run this we and print uh, memory locations, we see that everything uh, is in one place. Uh, yeah, and in our second example, like these pointers are uh, different. So, yeah, I was expecting to uh, slices to work like this every time. Unfortunately, they do not work like this. So be careful when using append. Uh, do not append to slice when you want to keep unchanged. Uh, yeah, and remember, you are never working on a copy of your data. Uh, okay, thank you. Quick question, how many of you have been beaten by this? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Same. Okay, so next up we have Yana. And round of applause for her. Hello. Uh, this is my eighth year at Fostem, fifth at uh, Go Devrum at Fostem. So it's been a wild ride and I have no intention to speak here, but I saw this room and I was like, this is legit, legit. <laughs> Uh, I should at least give a lightning talk. So these are some like style tips I have for Go packages because I signed up to be a uh, Go readability reviewer for a long time at Google and like some of this stuff is really obvious but it comes very often. So um, first of all, if you need any you know style guideline tips, uh, feel free to reach out to Go like knots or to Go for Slack. Uh, you should also check out the code review comments. This is just like general tips, and um, this entire presentation is also 
available as an article on uh, recul.org. Uh, style dash packages. So the first thing is about organization because organization is what matters. Um, um, you try to f use you know multiple files. Go allows you to split your package in multiple files, and you can just cl you know create some logical separation. For example, you can this is the HTTP package, and you can put all the header related stuff in headers.go, cookies related stuff in cookies.go, all the core stuff maybe in HTTP.go, or maybe it will get too long, and you can split it as uh, client.go and uh, you know server.go. Uh, try to use multiple files. The other thing is keep types closed. Uh, for example, the core header type can maybe fit better in the headers file because all the other methods and like other functionality, maybe some utilities will go there. Uh, some people usually make the mistake of like putting headers type into the HTTP.go file because, or at, at, at the initial you know, enter point of the, the HTTP package because it, they think that this is a core type, but try to you know, put it in where it makes sense uh, because you wanna be able to you know, jump back to the type and see and you know, use it as a reference. It kind of helps you with, you know, when you're reading the source code. The other thing is organized by responsibility. I came from you know, um, C and then later Java and I had this like, especially because of the Java background, I had this um, habit of creating, for example, a models you know, package. I would put all my entities there. In Go, we don't do this. We instead put everything by responsibility in their um, respective packages. Uh, for example, if you have users, that's cool. If you have a user service type of package or like a management package, put the user entity there because this is where you know, you know, they're, they're, you will also put functionality to return new users and that type of stuff. Um, provide examples in God, Godox. This is really actually cool because Go allows you to embed snippets in the Godox, and especially if the usage is not trivial, this is kind of like giving your users a way to like copy paste and like you know quickly just get an understanding of how to make a call uh, to the function. And there's a really good blog post actually on the Go blog about this. Uh, Go examples, Godox examples are testable, so you write them as test functions, and uh, they are run as a part of Go test. So you know they are compiled, tested, and they are never getting absolute uh, because they are a part of the uh, Go test. Um, I would say that, like, you know, try to optimize for Godoc because uh, this is something like when you're designing the API initially, try to take a look at what is, you know, going on on the Godoc. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that, like, you organize entirely, uh, but try to have a sense of what it, how it will be represented. Because Godoc will be the, you know, entry point of your users. And I said Go space doc because Francis told me that, like, it's, the, you know, the other stuff is deprecated. But uh, Go space doc HTTP will be only available in 1.11, so you better try to you know take a look at the current alpha whatever the official name because there's no RC. But um, either use Go doc or wait for 1.12. Anyways. Um, put, put binaries in a, a command. Uh, this is very common. Like all the like main functions should go into slash command. Like this is the go tool in the uh, go or core repository. I will talk about some naming stuff. Um, lowercase stuff only. No camel case. No like underscore. Short but representative names. No common. No util. If you want to use util, use like some context. Like say HTTP util. Try to enforce vanity URLs. If you have this like fancy URLs, you can enforce them. And write some docs, please. Document the page. You don't have any excuses. And use doc.go uh, doc if you have very long documentation so people can just you know, jump to that file and like, read as a maintenance release. And that's all. Take a look at these links. <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> OK, and up next we have uh, Go Performance Tuning. Cool. And a round of applause for him. Uh, whatever his name is. Oh, yeah, say your name. <laughs> oh, sure. uh, hi, I'm Richie. Um, I'm a developer on Uber's open source metric stack, M3, uh, which is all written in Go. Uh, this is originally a 30 minute talk, so I'm going to speak very quickly. Uh, I cut out a bunch of stuff, uh, but it's basically a, a war story from production. Um, so basically, Uber has a service called the Ingesters. 
uh, and their job is basically to just receive metrics at like regular intervals and then write them to storage as quickly as possible. Um, so one day we deployed our ingester service, kind of like routine deployment, because uh, they hadn't been deployed in a few months. Um, and you can see that the end-to-end -end latency um, before we deployed it was like 10 seconds, and after we deployed it was over 20 seconds. Um, so this is really bad because it means graphs don't load as quickly and alerts can't catch issues as quickly. So you want to keep this P99 latency low. Um, so we tried to figure out what went wrong, and that was really tricky because this code was in a monorepo. So we were like hundreds and hundreds of commits, and we hadn't deployed in months. Uh, so we weren't sure which one affected it. Um, so long story short, we did uh, a git biset in production, which is terrible. Um, but we found the issue. Uh, and it was this. Um, I don't have time to delve into the details, but basically the code on the right is almost the same as the code on the left. Um, it's just code that was inline got moved into a helper function. We're like, okay, that shouldn't make it that much slower. Like calling functions isn't, you know, isn't free, but it's not that expensive. It shouldn't make things twice as slow. Uh, so we were trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, we ran a bunch of micro benchmarks that showed no performance difference between these two versions of the clone function. Um, so sometimes micro benchmarks lie, but we took flame graphs of both services running in predict uh, production. And again, it looked like the service was spending the same amount of time in both versions of the code, so we were really confused. Um, kind of out of desperation, because when CPU profiles don't work, I kind of lose my mind, uh, we SCP'd the binaries down. Uh, and ran go tool object dump on them to get the assembly. And um, long story short, assembly is almost the same. Uh, the only thing we noticed though is that the clone bytes, which is like the helper method I was talking about earlier, uh, ends up not actually getting inlined, um, which got us thinking. And we went back and looked at the CPU profiles. Turns out CPU profiles don't lie, uh, humans just make mistakes. Um, and there actually was a pretty big difference in this one function called runtime.more stack. But we're like, oh, that's a runtime function. Runtime's always correct. Like, can't be my fault. Um, turns out that wasn't true. Um, so we dug into this, tried to figure out what this function does. And uh, it turns out in Go, every Go routine starts with a two kilobyte stack. Um, and then when you call a function, the runtime checks if you have enough room left on the stack to call the function. If you don't, allocates a new stack, twice as big, copies all the stack frames, uh, and then resumes execution. Um, so our new theory was that in production, our call stack was so deep, and we were right on the edge, that when you called clone, it would push you over the edge, and you'd allocate like a four, eight kilobyte stack, which is expensive. Um, and in the benchmarks, the stack was really shallow, so you wouldn't do that thing. Um, so we're like, okay, let's try this out. Um, basically, in our ingester service, all the code gets executed in this worker pool. Um, pretty standard, basically allocate a Go routine for every piece of work. Um, so to test this out, we wrote a new one where you allocate all the Go routines up front, you never let them die, they kind of hang around in the background, and then you assign them work via channels instead of spawning them constantly. And then you pay the stack growth cost once, right? And then you never have to pay it again. Uh, so we rolled this out to production. Um, and the code on the left, uh, the arrow on the left is showing us rolling back the regression so you can see the latency comes down. The arrow on the right, though, is when we released the worker pool. So it actually got even faster than it was before. So it was like, OK, cool. We actually made this faster than it ever was originally. Uh, which is great, but we were like, we haven't really proved anything. Like, this is all kind of like incidental. Like, couldn't send someone to prison over this, right? Um, so we're like, okay, let's just fork the Go compiler and figure out and add some print statements because that's how we debug everything uh, and see if this is actually happening. Uh, so we forked the Go compiler, uh, added some sampling so that we wouldn't be printing millions of logs, uh, compiled our service with the forked Go compiler, threw it up into production again because that was the only place where this issue would manifest, uh, it wouldn't show up in staging. Um, immediately started seeing logs like this where it's saying, okay, like around the clone bytes function, I just had to grow the stack from four kilobytes to eight kilobytes. So if you put an eight kilobyte allocation uh, in the hot path of your code, uh, that could definitely explain why it gets twice as slow. Um, and then we just basically counted the number of print statements and we saw that with the regression, there are a lot, and with the new worker pool, there was none. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No, no, you. <laughs> okay, uh, so up next we have people need to put their names. Ma Ma Cape John. Oh, John. Okay, cool. So up next we have John. So round of applause for John. Hi. Um, 
So this is going to be a little bit lighter than that sort of technical deep dive that we just had. Um, and it's a little tool, it's a little sort of um, package I wrote myself to sort of um, scratch an itch that I had where um, I was finding myself constantly sort of running commands to check the status of things, things that I just wanted to keep an eye on. And I thought I'd be far better keeping them up in the menu bar. So um, I ended up writing a package to help me generate uh, plugins for BitBar. So BitBar is an application written by Matt Ryer uh, that runs in OS X that sort of uh, handles the rendering of menu bar applications and has like a super simple interface. Um, you literally just have to drop in an executable that outputs text. It can be any language, it can be shell scripts, it can be absolutely anything. Um, and then you can control how frequently the, that refreshes just by appending a, a suffix to the files so like dot .30 seconds, dot .1 minute and so on. So I created a package called Go Bitbar after having originally written stuff using templates and it was you know, all very hand rolled, very difficult to sort of explain to somebody how to use. Um, and like, as I said, the main reason is that you, you can put pieces of information that you want up in your menu bar, so they're very quick to, to get to. If you have commands that you're constantly executing you just would like to, to get access to, you can just pop them up there. And because you're writing it, it's completely customizable, and you can write it in Go, which is good. Um, so using the package, this is what an absolute minimal uh, menu bar app would look like. So you create an instance of the app with the bit bar new. You create a status line entry. So the status line is what appears in the menu bar. So you can actually add a second one. You can just sort of invoke that status line method a second time and it will rotate between the two pieces of information. Uh, and then you, you can add submenus and you can nest submenus so you can have like multiple trees dropping off one another. And within a menu, you add a line and you can add multiple lines. Uh, and then you just finally call render, and that's what you end up with there. You end up with your hello and your world. So that's a really simple example. Um, some of the kind of more complicated ones that I ended up putting together were for a, a project I contribute to OpenFast. Um, I wrote a, a menu bar app that lets you sort of look at your OpenFast gateways and sort of see the status of all your functions and look at your Prometheus metrics just from the menu bar, um, which was kind of useful when you're when you're, you're developing and you maybe have left something running or you just want to kind of at a glance check what's going on. Um, and uh, so you can see there the, the sub menu and you've got actions. So if you click on the action, that's actually going to go and uh, invoke a command that deletes a function, you know, open the gateway, open Prometheus, they'll open Chrome and open browser. So you can do pretty complicated things uh, without having to write a huge amount yourself. Um, so like, for example, to, uh, to add a link to a URL, you just add a line, so give the line a bit of text, and then you use this href. It uses a, a builder pattern to build things up. The href just takes the URL. So in this case, it's an SSH URL, and it's just using OSX's open, so that'll just open a terminal, and the terminal is true so that it actually doesn't suppress the terminal. Um, but that could be a URL. It could be HTTP, HTTPS, whatever. Uh, if you want to execute a command, so you can execute any arbitrary command, but if you want to actually build some functionality into your plugin, what you can do is you can use Cobra, um, that, like Caroline showed earlier on, uh, and you can add extra subcommands. So in this case, I, I added a delete subcommand that in the rendering of, your, of your, your menu, it knows the host name and the context, and you, you basically, it just calls the, the plugin again with delete and the name of the host name. Um, the terminal is false because that stops the terminal popping up, so it just goes ahead and deletes it and you don't see a terminal pop up. And the refresh true automatically refreshes the menu bar so you get the latest information. So some other ones, this is this is some very, very lazy and opening a browser is, is too much work. Um, I have a menu bar app that shows a traffic camera from uh, my trip home. So. Uh, <laughs> um, some links. So um, Matt Ryer's BitBar app is on Get BitBar. I'm always surprised at the number of people who haven't actually heard of that. It's it's really really awesome. And there's a link to the uh, package for building your own plugin. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least. Ron Evans, uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit more than two minutes. You have like maybe five minutes because we have the room to close, and I know Can that yours is complicated. Uh, yes. You do you. Uh, this. Thank you. Thank you. 
it's, it sometimes works. I see something. This is good. So the demo is setting up projector with Linux. <laughs> <laughs> the smarter the, the more intelligent the speaker, the more AV problems. I have no AV problems, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you ready? I'm ready. Cool. Run all of us for run. Hey, everybody. Before I get started, I just want to say let's give up a big round of applause for Francesc and for Margie. They have done an amazing job organizing this. Come on, give it up for them. There were others, but I can't pronounce their names. I'm really sorry. I can barely pronounce yours. All right, so I am Dead Program, Ron Evans in the real world, Dead Program on all the internets. I run a small consultancy called the Hybrid Group. We do software for hardware companies, and I really like robots. But you probably know that. You may have seen me talk about GoBot, which is Go Programming for Middleware for Robotics, or GoCV, which is Computer Vision in Go using OpenCV. But today I'm here to talk about a really cool new project that I've been collaborating with my colleague called TinyGo. So it's a go for small places, really small. We mean like microcontrollers. In other words, devices that have between 8K and 32K of RAM. I did not say megabytes, I said K, K, thousand, small, right? Or WebAssembly, but you know, we'll get to that in some other future time. So everyone says go is too big. Right? Everyone says Go is just too big. Well, a gopher is a gopher, no matter how small. <laughs> Actually, Dave Cheney did not say that, but doesn't that sound like something he would say? <laughs> so, thank you, Dave. Dr. Dave. So, I'm going to show you right now that Go can be tiny. Yes, it is true. I am going to show you, and I'm going to show you with this. Let me put the mic down for a second. Hopefully not, even though I appreciate that, uh, I might. It's always a pleasure. We shall see. So first I'm going to run a GoCV program, so I've got my camera. Hello, okay. And so now I'm going to show you the microcontroller I'm going to use, which is this Itsy Bitsy, literally Itsy Bitsy M0. It's made by Adafruit. It is a really cool little board. I kind of almost do need two hands. Three, whatever. More. All right, so the Itsy Bitsy is a microchip, the company that bought Atmel SAMD21. It's an ARM Cortex M0. It's a 32 bit processor, 48 megahertz speed, and 256K of flash memory. 256K. All right, so let's do this. The Hello World of Things using Tiny Go is a very simple little Go program, package main. We import machine, which is our package from TinyGo, how we integrate with the actual hardware devices. The time package, you've seen that before. And then our main, our first thing we're going to do is say LED equals machine dot GPIO machine dot LED. So we're saying this particular machine's LED. We're going to configure it to be a GPI output. So that means we're going to send something out versus receive a signal in. And then for ever, first we're going to set it to low. In other words, turn it off. We're going to sleep for 500 milliseconds, then we're going to turn it on, and then sleep for another 500 milliseconds. So it's the hello world of things as a blinky light. So let's see if this works. First, I'm going to plug it in. It's plugged in. I'm trying to talk into the microcontroller. Next demo. Next demo. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to press the little button on this twice to put it into the bootloader mode so I can load, load new software. I can't show the, can't show the camera. <laughs> That's kind of cute. I should, keep, I should do that on purpose. <laughs> so we're going to load this code by compiling it first. Okay, so we just compiled a bin file. So let's look at how big that bin file is real quick. So we can say that is a 
2,376 bytes in size, okay, that program. So let's put it on here. So we're just going to convert it into a hex file, which then is going to convert it into the UF2 bootloader format. So it just copies it on there, and now if we go to the camera, we can see it is blinking. Yes, it is real. How can you do that? Isn't that impossible? Well, luckily the Go compiler tool chain itself is written in Go. And then there's this other thing called the LLVM, which is a actual toolkit for building compilers. So if we put those things together, we can use Go's front end to put it into SSA form, then use Tiny Go's compiler to turn that into the intermediate representation that LLVM uses, and then use LLVM to generate binary code. So it's a different way. It's a different gospel of the Go compiler, if you will. <clears throat> so you want to know more? tinygo.org, we have a great website that has been put together by the founder of this project, IK, who's actually in the back of the room kind of embarrassed right now, uh, and a bunch of other collaborators. Also, come see my talk tomorrow, Building K, that's the big building in La Fontaine, 11 a.m. You should be there. Why? Because first of all, it's the first ever FOSDEM main room talk about Go. Isn't that incredible? And it's a very small Go. So there will be prizes, uh, thanks to Adafruit and others. So if you show up, you can maybe win something. So definitely don't miss it. Main room, Building K, La Fontaine, 11 a.m. Be there, be there, be there. Also, the very first ever Tiny Go BOF will also be tomorrow at 1300 hours. So after we've all kind of calmed down from the drones flying around and stuff, we can talk about all this. So thank you very much. And with this, I'm out. Uh, with this, <laughs> we're done. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Special thanks to all of the speakers. Uh, without you, this would not be possible. And what? Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, so we are all grown-ups and responsible. So if you brought some trash, take it out with you. If you didn't break any trash, but there's some around you, take it out with you. And if you are interested in seeing me suffer tomorrow, I'm seeing a whole day. I will be at the M ML on Code Broom. So I'll be there. See you tomorrow.